And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildred, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, creator of Tian Sheng and the upcoming Lone Wolf Fists. Which is, which is currently running on currently running on Kickstarter with 19 days to go at the time of this recording. The one and only Joel T. Clark. How you doing tonight, man? I like that I'm the one and only Joel T. Clark. One of this one other dude who's like, Curses, he stole my title. And he looks otherwise just like me, but he's got a really stupid voice like that. Um, I'm, try I'm trying to head it off at the past in case, we have in case I have to deal with some Liquid Clark situation. Liquid Clark situation. <laughs> <laughs> like a time traveling version of me. It's like just like one shade more capable of killing people. So it's like not really that capable. Was, I've got like a lamp even, and I keep falling on it. I wasn't even gonna go with the time travel thing. I was gonna go I was gonna go with the I was gonna go with the clones. That's why I brought it. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, we should probably head that one off at the past. I did put clones in a in the uh Blood from God's Eye thing for mm -hmm. the Kickstarter, so it yeah, it's not completely impossible that I've cloned myself for the amount of work I get done on this stupid thing. Plus, um, I had recently seen the video where, um, <laughs> where, um, Liquid Snake's voice actor decides to decides to drive up to a Taco Bell and and order in the, in the voice. <laughs> well, brother, I'll have the chalupa. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Apparently, it was a response to to somebody asking David Hayter to re to read off like he was a Taco Bell employee. <laughs> That's one chalupa, sir. Anything else? <laughs> oh my God, that'd be amazing. First of all, I actually follow David Hayter on Twitter. I love him so much. He's that wonderful combination of really capable at his job and like a ton of antics. Mm -hmm. So he's he's a he's a fun follow on Twitter. If you don't, but man, now I just kind of want to. I want to get successful enough. I can start hiring those two hmm. and the rest of their that wonderful voice like uh, voice cast and just have them do with ridiculous stuff. <laughs> um, I do th I do think we I do think a bridge needs to be needs to be um forged between voice a between voice actors and good old fashioned shit posting. Yes, I concur, uh, and I think David Hayter is on our mm -hmm. side with that one too. He's yeah. the one that kept doing that. Uh, my my ass is too fat and. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the line? Uh, 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 I'm, I'm dumb, dummy I'm dummy thick, thick and the right. clap my ass keeps <laughs> alerting the guards. Oh god! Every time I hear that phrase, I just start cackling like a wild baboon. I, yeah. I to this day, I love it. Yeah. So, lone wolf fists, as it as it is, essentially, essentially, you've you've pitched it in the in the past as. Be, as being the role-playing version of Hokuto no Ken, with a, with a little bit with a little bit of your previous um, Wuxia-related work, um, since it's since it's using the same system as um, Tian Sheng, mm -hmm. and when I had you on in the past, we ta we talked about the um, love-hate relationship with trying to get Weapons of the Gods and Legends of the Wulin to work as written. Yeah. Oh, man. The, those games are so they're kind of amazing and that nothing ever really challenged them in what they really wanted to do. But like I always felt like there was this vast untapped potential to them, you know, because Weapons of the Gods didn't have a bestiary and like the skill system was a little bit trite in it. So like it just sort of felt like an afterthought. But like whenever you got to fighting, it was so robust and rich mm -hmm. and it wasn't so much that like those games were bad or even incomplete in, the, in so much that, that I just felt like they had a potential that just needed to get broadened, deepened. And so, yeah, yeah uh, they're fantastic games, but I just wanted more. And I think if, if that's like the biggest complaint you have against a system, like I want this game to be more of itself. That's not a too bad of a complaint to have, really. Especially since um, the... The uh, die system that we got out, we got out of that approach. Um, for one, it for one, doing a sum based die system with with a pool isn't exactly a common occurrence. Yeah, um, it's based on the one roll engine style of doing it, where mm -hmm. you're matching up uh, matching up sets of dice, which I really like that. And the dice math behind that is really weird, uh, and therefore fun. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I one mean, of the things that kind of sucks about a lot of die systems, especially die pool systems, is that the math is very simplistic. And so, like, it's easy to calculate the best move you could be making. But in this one, it really is bizarre math. It goes in weird directions. And so it, it makes it so that you really have to think on your feet mm-hmm. when you get a given roll. And I like that a lot more. You're more engaged with it, I find. Mm-hmm. The and the other th- the other thing, of course, is the fact that um, the in- the inclusion of ri- the inclusion of river means that dice results get a little less swingy because that's something I've seen I've seen happen in some in some other games that use a um di- that use a sum based die pool approach where mm-hmm. you either roll really well or you roll like shit but you but there's not really an in between. Well, yeah, the river helps to mitigate that, and uh, giving you lots of options for different kinds of rolls helps to mitigate that. Like sometimes you only have like a really good high single die, what we call a, because you kind of think of the dice like a hand of poker, mm-hmm. and like if you get dealt and you have like a high nine and that's your hand, that's a crap hand, but you can still win with that in poker. And I wanted to kind of preserve that sort of thing. Yeah. So. Uh, and the, the uh, another one was having a secondary system that could kind of change the value of your die pool like because we have the prana system which is like your magic go-go juice Mm -hmm. and you just buy like dice and sets to increase what you've rolled so even a a relatively crummy roll depending on how you built your character can really the value of that roll is really different depending on your build so like you'd have a character that's able to do a lot of one die attacks uh like nuke of the play test can do that a lot and so she'll just tear through someone else's effort and whoop their ass mm-hmm. whereas a character that more relies on like having a single big set to center their turnaround would be a little more screwed um yeah. and I, I like that a lot mm-hmm. now when it now I might be touching on some of the on some of the um matters that we that we discussed the last time I had you on but mm-hmm. when it came to do when it came to doing Something like Lone Wolf, something like Lone Wolf Fist. Was it was it born out of just wanting to do Hokuto no Ken in R, in RPG form, or a was that or is that just one part one part of the puzzle? Well, a lot, a lot of it was uh, watching Fist of the North Star mm-hmm. because Fist of the North Star does have an anime uh, mm-hmm. or an anime uh, RPG. Actually, a couple like Besom did a version of it. Um, I admit, they might not have it. They might have done Demon City Shinjuku. Uh, but uh, there was also like a proprietary game that was done by an Italian company, I want to say. And no one ever really quite got it right. Like they get like a lot of the elements of the show and, and transcribe them. But the way you actually played those games didn't reflect like the, how you they didn't feel like being a character from that universe at all. And so like there's something about that anime and the the manga and everything and all the, the movie that spawned out of it like there's something about it where it feels like you should be able to role play that you know it really is just a guy or a small group of competent dudes like going around this post-apocalyptic wasteland kind of mad maxing it up except instead of having like mad max's power set they've got like this kind of like list of fighting game kung fu moves mm-hmm. and like it's weird that something that's that gameable of an idea was never even attempted for the most part. So it felt like a real niche that needed to have like something there. Um, if I had to, so, if I had to guess as to why, and I'm and I'm not th- I'm not throwing shade at anybody who's done this. Anybody who's done this um, previously. This is just my own little crackpot ass theory. <laughs> I. Some something that I something that I've often seen when people when people have asked about how they'd adapt to this or that um, TV show, anime, comic, what what have you, into role playing is that they get they get way too hung up on trying to emulate the letter of it and not the spirit of it. Mm. Yeah, I um, think that, I think that's a lot. There's a little bit of that. The and a lot of people a lot of people just saw. Um, just saw post apocalypse and martial arts, and something something else to take into account is that at the time frame that those games were out, anime was not was not something that was um, even then very very well understood. I mean, it, mm. it was un- it was understood by people, but not but not to the extent where we understand genres or understand um, writer quirks. I'm pretty sure nobody even knew what the hell Sakuga was, which mm. if you get if you get if you get that one, can of coke. Um, 
and a lot and a lot of the they knew that they wanted to do something in the style of it, but a lot of but a lot of what we know about anime now wasn't no, wasn't known then because we're talking like li- like um late nineties with a lot of with a lot of those attempts. Oh yeah, and even though it was, I think originally designed in the late eighties, like we didn't really get it here in the states much until the late nineties, which is mm-hmm. when I started getting into anime. That's when it really started to become popular. There was a little bit of stuff earlier than that, like your Voltrons and your Robotex and your Sailor mm-hmm. Moons, but like it really was like Toonami in like the late nineties, kind of bringing it to the mainstream and then the Sci Fi Channel at festivals of anime around that time. Yeah, that's kind of what brought it to the awareness of nerd culture, as far as I'm aware. And it's it's funny you mentioned Toonami because that's credited with um sa- with saving two shows that didn't work out in Japan. Um, mm. one of th- one of them was um Cowboy Bebop, which almost got shit canned ha- in thirteen episodes instead of the twenty six that they got. Wow, I didn't know that. Like, also, they, that's crazy. What a what a great anime to be nearly canceled. Yeah, they um they ra- they ran up against the censors a lot during its initial airing. Yeah, okay, that makes um, sense. <laughs> and the the other one, which just wasn't able to find a footing because of how different it was from from everything going on at the time, was um, Big O. Oh yeah, yeah, and Big O was a fascinating little one too because it was like it, it kind of had the same thing with Neon Genesis Evangelion, where you sort of came in because they were big cool robots, mm-hmm. and then when you started watching it, you're like, that's not really what this show is about, is it? This show is about something else, huh? Yeah, um, I kind of like that about NG. I'll watch that anytime I get depressed. I'll be like, "Well, time to see Shinji save the world." <laughs> Third impact. Um, it's, fun, it's funny that you it's funny that you mentioned a- Ava since I had since I had since I had his um, voice actor on a, f- a few weeks ago. Ooh, I need to check that out. I missed that episode. Um, but when when it came to the of course the other thing that's funny is that both of them were um, sunrise anime because sometimes mm. the universe has to be reminded that sunrise does things other than other than Gundam all, all the damn time. Oh, like God, the animation in G was so beautiful yeah, too. Like they're they're capable of they're capable of doing a, of 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 other shows and even with that they're still the kings when it comes to technical design. But mm. it's in, like I've seen I um. To kind of to kind of further that point of not really getting not really getting the spirit of it, um, a long time ago, I remember when um, standalone complex was coming out. Somebody mm. had asked me how I'd adapt um, go, how I'd adapt Ghost in the Sh- how I'd make a Ghost in the Shell RPG. Ooh, tough one too. Because again, you have to you have to ask yourself what is Ghost in the Shell about. Mm-hmm. And that's a really hard question to actually answer, honestly. It's a question that can have multiple answers because the ori- the manga by Shiro Masamune, the or- the original Oshi films, um, the original mm-hmm. and Innocence, and a- and actually I should probably split those two films because they have different vibes entirely. They um, really do. The standalone complex anime, mm. the and the Rise anime all have different answers to that question. Yeah, and, and no one of them feels like it's being false to the central ideals of the show, which is pretty impressive, I mm-hmm. think. But because because of that, I'd say I'd say for a lot of people, their their assumed answer is go- is going to be the original film. But that's not an assumption that that you or I can make when we're when we're asked that kind of question. And the bigger yeah, question it, that I'd have, that I'd have to bring up is. What in what in either of those works is there that would necessitate having to be its own system when I when I could use um, something like say Cyberpunk twenty twenty? Yeah, Cyberpunk could be something that would immediately pop into my head to use for that. Like uh, you'd have to adapt it a little bit, but like not much. Cyberpunk kind of nailed it. Yeah, uh, you can credit the brilliant Mike Pondsmith for that mm-hmm. kind of revolutionary design. Yeah, but. When the, when it comes to this whole, I'd say the other reason why um, why previous attempts to try and do a fifth of the North Star esque RPG didn't quite hit the mark is be, is because of the fact that a large amount of the sensibilities with something like Fist of the North Star is rooted in um, wuxia. 
Mm, yeah, and, that is really prevalent whenever you rewatch it, which I was doing recently. And Wuxia, even though it's been around for centuries, has not been fully has not been fully understood as a concept by the West up until about ten years ago. I want to say. Well, remember, Wuxia, as we understand it as a modern genre, actually is not that old. It actually started around the 1950s in yeah. China. So it's a very recent kind of phenomena. And yeah, as far as it filtering into the West, a lot of our understanding of it kind of came from Bruce Lee movies in the 70s, which is sort of a removed and westernized version of it in the first place. Like really getting into the wuxia genre's history has been fascinating. You did that with uh, Brendan Davis of um, uh, uh, Wandering Heroes of Ogre Gate fame and also uh, Jeremy Bai for a little while. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have their own thing going on right now, right? Just Blood, Ruthless Blades, which looks really super good, by the by. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, been, keeping an, I've been keeping an eye on that. Um, yeah, it looks really cool. And uh, and of course, and of course, um, of course, with Brendan, he I've had I've had him on plenty of times, and he gave me a crash course on um, on Ch- on Chinese horror films, even the, <laughs> starting with the comedic ones like Mister Vampire. That sounds well, exactly like something that Brendan would do. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He probably sold you on Chinese Ghost Story, which, if you haven't seen, is one of my favorite of all time movies, period. I actually put it up there with Ghostbusters in terms of just how watchable and brilliantly paced it is. It's really, really good. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, from now, um, I'd say I'd say that even with the even with the cons, the reason why I don't put in um, Bruce Lee movies when it comes to that mm. is less be is. Well, that's it's one of those things that's technically true, but in the in, but um, even with that, the term wuxia didn't start re- didn't really start getting thro- didn't really start getting thrown about at the time. They were just they were just seen as as just kick ass action films. Yeah, and that's kind of us interpreting them uh, through our like cultural lens of how we do action films. But mm-hmm. it's it's its own thing. Like having that whole like martial underworld is is kind of a unique thing to the wuxia genre. And I think that's probably the biggest defining element of it, aside from like uh, like the styles themselves also add a lot to it. Like the, the anytime you see different rival kung fu factions with their own styles and what have you, mm-hmm. like that for me at least it's dovetailing in the wuxia genre, which does kind of expand it because it means stuff like uh, Remnants of the Three Kingdoms, which is a very old text, mm-hmm. um, uh, or um, The Legend of the Handsome Monkey King, again, extremely old text, and which have that kind of rooting in like uh, Taoist cultivation and things like that. Those are kind of the ancestors of wuxia in that regard. So Yeah. Um, now for me, when it, came, when it came to actually hearing the term proper, I didn't. I didn't really. I didn't really start. I didn't really start hearing it until the two thousands when I first saw Hero. Yeah. And and then th- and then through that I found out about um, some of the comics that um, Comics One was putting out, Weapons yeah. of the Gods, and more pertinently, and w- the one I actually preferred, um, the Storm Riders. Yeah, I heard Storm Riders was awesome. I've not yet actually had a chance to dip my toe into it. I read some episodes of the Gods, which I mean, of course, mm-hmm. but like, uh, yeah, I've heard good things. And I need to start picking them up on Amazon because they're cheap. Also, um, Chun Rang Shir Shun and its uh, sequel now were uh, were ones that I get, or ones that I um, happened upon at that time, and th- and then it was just a and then it was just a rabbit hole because then then <laughs> I found out about Avatar and then I th- and. <laughs> I've mentioned in the past that Jade Empire is still my favorite Bioware game, mm, so yeah. it, so it just kind of sp- just kind of spiraled out. And for me, what um what I saw what I saw the potential with it is the fact that here is here is a sti- here is a style of storytelling where the magic martial divide it, that we see so often in in um Europe in European influenced fantasy is non-existent. Yeah, it's, it doesn't even make sense in that paradigm. Because because Marshall is does eventually kind of become magical in that one. Yeah, the it's it's one of those th- it's one of those things where the two where the two are one and the same. Um and that's wh- that's why whenever um it's you've probably had the experience of of somebody coming into playtesting who had previously played like wizards or warlocks and Having to having having to tell them that there is not that even though there are mages, 
in a lot of these kind of and something like weapons of the gods or, or the like it's not in the same sense <laughs> right you're still totally buff even if you're like a scrawny wizard it's mm-hmm. it's really a little bit of it for the most part i think people are becoming a little more like broadly aware of the tropes like you were talking about of like mm-hmm. wuxia and anime yeah. and so it's not quite as bad as it would have been like if i was playtesting this a couple even like five or ten years ago mm-hmm. where it would have been a, a way bigger thing um I do have people that really want specifically to be things like sorcerers, though, and like they kind of want to, they want to be more focused and, and not have that kind of broadening of capability that this uh, sort of genre suggests with the way power works. Because it's a it's a weird power curve, right? Because it goes up, but you also kind of just become good at everything. So a lot of people sort of resist that idea. They're like, no, I, I want to have my weaknesses because it's kind of the Western way of doing it is it's just sort of like in balance in favor of something. Whereas the Eastern way of doing it is like having this broad balance and then in, in picking specialties within that broader umbrella. Although so. whenever, whenever I'd, I'd say, I'd say that I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people who do the argument of, of wanting their weaknesses probably have a background, um, that's ma- that's majorly tied into class based design. Mm. Yeah, class based kind of funnels your imagination in that direction. I find, although again, like if you look into the murky beginnings of that, even even old D anD D has stuff like uh, the uh, the way the elf worked, where it was kind of both. You got to have all martial and all caster. Yeah, so. and all and also be overpowered as fuck. <laughs> yeah. They, well, I mean, they need a lot more XP. Like, because mm-hmm. I, whenever I run those kinds of games, like, I find that, that character is amazing at level one, but their level one lasts almost twice as long as everyone else's. So when you're tooling around with a level two fighter and a level two mage and a level two cleric, and you still only have one D8's worth of health, like, okay, that does kind of suck. So I think it's reasonably well balanced. Yeah. Um, it's, it's most, it's, that's mostly me just, ma- just making a dig and. <laughs> Take that, you damn elf. Knife feared um, bastards. Yeah, no. Look, I look. I um. I have repeated. I have repeatedly referenced dwarven diplomacy when it comes when it comes to the, the to the elven question. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, I had this hilarious scene in a game. Actually, a fifth ed game. It was the last time I ran fifth ed, which was right after it came out, which was when my youngest son was still in diapers. So yeah, it was a while ago. Mm-hmm. But I had this fun thing where. Uh, a bunch of elves were trying to do a siege and a bunch of dwarves showed up to help them on behest of the party. And the elves kept trying to like leap outside of the walls and like, like kind of take the battle to the bad guys, like going through the forest and what have you. And the dwarves are like, no, it's a siege. You stay in the walls. And they were just, the elves are baffled by this. So eventually, so I don't know what got into me. I have one dwarf in PC just come like stump out and he's like, okay, look, here's a story. Uh, th- there's this, a uh, grandfather I had that was on a chamber pot and there was a crack in the wall and this goblin came through it and he killed it and then there were a bunch of more goblins behind that and he kept fighting them while still in the chamber pot but because he stayed right where he was he always had the advantage and they called it the battle of the chamber pot and for to this day that story lives in empath- in, in infamy as like the way that dwarven strategy like strategic thought works in my games the yeah. battle of the chamber pot it's immortal now mm-hmm. now when it comes now, um, given the fact that Lone Wolf Fist is more is more or less using the same system that you had developed in um, Tian Sheng, mm-hmm. um, what were what were some of the th- what were some of the things that you f- that you felt pertinent to keep, and what were some of the things you felt wouldn't um fit wouldn't fit with this transfer? Oh man, that's a tough one. Okay, so. Tianxiang is a way bigger and kookier system in a lot of ways. And, mm-hmm. like, tonally, you have to understand that it's it's like reading a Jack Kirby comic. Uh, David Ramirez has done a lot of really amazing setting work for it. And so it has stuff like chi vampires and, like, giant monster transformations and all these things you can do with characters that are fantastic, but tonally, like, they really alter the way you interact with a setting. Because if you can, like, go... Ozaru and become this giant ape monster and start stomping through a planet you just have a different perspective on it than if you're just a guy who has to walk through the ruins of something like that you know so like the transformations and like the really over the top like Kamehameha wave powers Mm -hmm. I largely curtailed Um, it still kind of crests to that point 
Uh, but what I wound up giving you was about half of the power of scale that the game can completely do within this one, with the idea that because again, I, I had a lot of I had a lot of come to God moments with deciding this game, man. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had to double the gulfs between the different tiers in the power scale for this latest draft just to make sure that characters weren't like casually picking up trains and throwing them. Like I want that to happen, but I want it to be really significant. I don't want it to be like, oh, I'm Sabine, suplex train. Mm -hmm. I do want suplex train to happen. I even commissioned art of a guy suplexing a train just specifically to get that idea in players' minds. But I don't want that to be every session, all session is going to be train suplex a clock. I want you to mm -hmm. earn that a little bit. So, um... The, the biggest thing is, like, in in uh, Chan Chang, All Above Heaven, you get to this power level where you're kind of, like, Dragon Ball Z scale powerful, where you can just, like, point at a city and, like, finger, like, zap it out of existence. Mm -hmm. And that's appropriate for a game where you're hopping from planet to planet, but when you're on one world and you have to deal with the consequences of that, that's way too casual of a way to annihilate huge swathes of content you're supposed to interact with. Like, imagine if a wizard could just point at a mega dungeon and blow it to pieces. It's just, that's way too powerful. So I managed, I, I had to do stuff like, think of, okay, when someone does that in this game, which they eventually will, what's the consequence of it? And eventually I realized that, oh, wait, Lone Wolf Fist as a setting is the consequence of that happening. <laughs> when the space gods go and battle on a planet, this is what's left over. Mm -hmm. So, like, the, the upper tiers of the power scale was something that I had to think of consequentially in terms of having to continue to be uh, interacting with it after it's blown up. So that was one thing that was really big. The transformations I had to take out, uh, or at least massively curtailed. There's a few transformations, but they're a little rarer. Um, yeah. There's a big focus on resources, which isn't quite as big of a thing in All Above Heaven because it's such a bigger scale. Like, counting how much iron you can get out of an iron mine isn't quite as important in that game. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really important in this one because you can do a, a story like Ninja Scroll where the plot of Ninja Scroll revolves around them getting some gold. That's it. Yeah. And it's a huge plot with a lot of drama. But you have to make sure, like, as a scaler, that makes sense that they actually need gold and can use it. Mm -hmm. So. And when it comes, the other thing that I, the other thing, of course, that that I've seen is that you can, is that you kind of, you kind of brought in the um, unique spin that that um, weapons of the gods has on st on status effects and buffs and debuffs. Mm, yeah, um, the imbalances. What, um, what were with bringing something like that in, which I can, I can under, I can definitely understand why. Um, hmm. but what I'm curious about is what, what did you want to focus on with doing it? And what did you want to avoid that you saw that you saw as a bit of a pitfall that it ha that it f fell into originally? Well, uh, that set of rules, the, the chi imbalances really came to their own and became centralized in the design of legends of the Wulin, right? Like all the different classes had a way of interacting with imbalances, and you were expected to constantly have to deal with them. And they were a way of bringing forth, like, the, the kind of weird chi-based Taoist alchemy stuff that informed a lot of the, uh, the setting of Wuxia and gave it a lot of its flavor. So it was really appropriate for that game for them to be a central thing. And although I still wanted them to exist, because, again, in Hokuto Shinkin, like... Whenever you get your pressure points poked, something is going to happen to you. And I wanted to make certain that that something had some mechanical teeth. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like the ideas that they present. At the same time, I don't necessarily want it to be as central to the game. I think that the fighting itself should be what's central. So it had to be a robust system that was usable but not something that was like the the core thing you would consistently deal with. It had to be a little bit more optional than that. So, and there were a few things about like the way Legends of the Wulin approached games was very informed by like the the way that uh, the Forge uh, as a design paradigm would approach games. Mm -hmm. Like it was much more about telling a collaborative story. And so like you had like these things where you could like buy different parts of the story to become relevant with your XP. And that makes sense if you are doing a communal storytelling exercise, but it does not make sense if you're doing a more tactical based thing. 
uh, like old school D&D, where there's not really a story assumed at the core of it. It's just more of a set of like tactical situations that are assumed at the core of it. So like I wanted to make sure any place where because I was changing that very basic assumption of how you approached this game as a as a as an exercise. So like I had to make certain that anywhere that imbalances kind of like faffed around in that territory that wouldn't have any relevance to this kind of play was mm-hmm. changed dramatically. Like it was really common whenever I ran Legends of the Woolen for people to think about them in terms of pure tactics, because that's sort of the way I, I run games as I do mm-hmm. them like old school style. And so we'd have a lot of imbalances that sounded stupid, but were difficult to describe around, which tactically is the best way to do them. Like I had yeah. one guy who was famous for burning the palms of the hands of his opponents. So they couldn't use their weapons because that had like this cascade effect with how you couldn't use a certain weapon, so You couldn't use a certain style. So like, it totally ruined a lot of characters because their palms were burned. But that's uh-huh. dumb. That's not a very dramatically interesting thing. It's just, it's very tactically effective. So I wanted to make sure I was avoiding that. I was like, mm-hmm. no, 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 no. These need to be, these need to look cool dramatically. Mm-hmm. So they serve like that role where, you know, they get the guy who gets like stabbed through the chest and he's still fighting and he makes a dramatic speech and then he coughs up blood and begins to die. Yeah. Like I wanted that to be something that was real in the game and that would happen consistently. Uh, I like whenever someone's arm or leg gets broken or, or several limbs get broken. And so they're less effective at fighting. Uh, so like the early fights in Dragon Ball Z, especially the fights against Nappa and Vegeta, the first time they fight, mm-hmm. like all of the Z characters get just ruined in those and seeing arms get torn off or broken and legs get broken and people have their ribs crushed and they keep fighting in this terrifying like slobber knocker of a battle i was like i really want that to be something they have to deal with in strategic terms and i want Mm -hmm. because it gives you a reason to role play you know when your arm is broken and suddenly you can't use your kamehameha wave because you got a broken arm there's a real tactical trade-off there do i do i eat some dice to make myself way less capable of fighting or do i not use my most powerful attack because i literally can't because my arm's broken so there was a lot of that where I had to design and redesign those things. I also wanted them to stick around. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's because of the way healing worked in Legends of the Woolen. They had this infuriating habit where you would just roll to recover at the end of a round or the end of a uh, combat, and they just go away. And they clearly were designed to stick around as something that was stuck onto your character for a while. So like mm-hmm. if you had an internal imbalance, it mattered, and it was something that had she was supposed to inform play, but it kind of didn't. Is the way that that system worked. So I wanted them to be more resilient than just losing hit points. So there were some teeth whenever you were fighting. And again, in the ongoing broader tactical exercise of the game, if you if your arm is broken, you have to take time for it to heal. And time as a resource was really important to this game because like everything's kind of on a ticking clock. Uh, even Blood and God's Eye, I, I put a ticking clock in there where you have exactly seven days before Flesh Eating Sage summons Naraka and he gets a ton more difficult to beat. Mm-hmm. So if you get injured in an early fight, that has real implications. And finding someone that can heal you is a real important tactical element of that game. And convincing them to heal you is an important tactical element of how you approach the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, there, there was a lot of thought actually that went into it. And of course, I wanted to retain the coolness of the secret arts where you get to mess with different imbalances. And that doesn't work well unless... A, they have real solid rules and consequences, and B, they're resilient enough to stick around even if you have a, a, a safe zone to heal in. So, yeah. Now, given given the emphasis on tactics that you that you mentioned, that brings me to some to something that some games struggle with, and some and some games are able to handle it with a little bit more grace, and that is the Nova question. What's the Nova question? I'm curious. Um, are you familiar with the concept of of someone novaing in um, RPGs? Nova, no. I mean, like it sounds like they're just like shooting a big old gun, kind of thing. Um, novaing is when is when is when somebody decides to just unload all, just unload as many of their offensive abilities at at once at a single opponent. All the stuff that they've been all the stuff that they've been saving. Oh, um, oh, what they call a, an alpha strike, where you just shoot your biggest gun first. Yeah. Um, okay. I just shoot. I've I've found that Nova is used as a as a more general catch all because obviously alpha strike is going to be limited to just battle tech and mech warrior. 
Well, no, the the Alpha Strike is what the groups around here always called it because like those were super popular and influential games. Mm -hmm. So it, specifically, an Alpha Strike is when you hit first with your biggest, most boomy attack, and then I think I guess Novaing is more just like hitting them with hitting them with everything you've got, kind of a thing. Yeah. But um, they, they sort of revolve around that same idea where if I hit you hard enough the first time, I win as mm -hmm. a strategy. And I don't think that's an unrealistic strategy. I will say that in earlier drafts of the game, actually the last time I interviewed you even, it was an early enough draft of the game where you started off with a pool of prana and you could use that to launch some pretty hefty attacks in the first few rounds of a combat, which were a really big game changer because if you get hit hard enough early enough, you get a big imbalance and you have to deal with that for the rest of the combat or you could just get taken out. Mm -hmm. So the alpha strike problem, and it wasn't really a problem so much because like, I don't think that's an illegitimate tactic. It's, you know, like it's not a, it's, it's not a case of an illegit. This it's one of those things where, where, um, where you have, where you have to, where you have to do the balancing act about what's, what's going to be tactically sound and what's going to be narratively sound because well, what's going to be fun to play mm -hmm. too, because if it's all they do every time they approach a combat, it's going to get, it's going to get a real one note. And if nothing can really realistically challenge them, then you've removed a lot of the, the fun of engaging in that game because the bad guys can't do something that thwarts that tactic. They can't really mm -hmm. learn a way that they can adapt because the system isn't really considering that that's a tactic that's going to crush it. But no, uh, I actually wound up finding a really good uh, way to get to not cur not like crush it, but really curtail it in that I just swapped uh, the pool that they got and made it really low with the recovery they got at the end of the first round, which was really high. So now you get a really significant amount of recovery uh, in early rounds that continues to go up, but the initial pool you start with is really, really low. So you're not constantly throwing around your magical weight without drawing a lot of attention to yourself by powering up, number one. Uh, so that's a good kind of thing to curtail that out of combat. And in combat, it's not really possible to use your more powerful attacks until the second or third round because you just don't have the prana to power them. So yeah. that really helped out with that. And it's it sounds to me that you can't you even though it's not exactly the same, it's loose it's loosely similar to the um escalation die um ish thing that thirteenth age has, which Oh yeah, big that that was a big inspiration for that. By the way, mm -hmm. I, I feel like the the escalation die, in theory and in practice, is really good for doing what it needs to do, but it's just it's so far outside and unconnected from like what should be happening in a in a realistically consistent world, and I, I think consistent world is what mm -hmm. I'm going with here. It's such a game idea, kind of invading into the world that you're trying to make that I I wasn't satisfied with it. So yeah, this is kind of like my version of that, where it's like okay, within the context of the fission, why is the why are the stakes raising? And they're raising because like you're you're opening up more your your chakras and you're you're getting all gl blue and glowy, you know, like they do in the, the anime. Mm -hmm. Like that's it's it's consistent with what you'd see in those shows. It's consistent with the fiction, and it means that like you can do that even if there's no threat around, but. Because you're making a giant target of yourself, it's really likely the bad guys are going to show up and they're going to give you a reason to have escalated to that point. Yeah, and given you given you mentioned the whole glow, the whole thing with glowing, um, for whatever reason, one one of the things that popped in my head was the um two, was the two types of essence that you had in Exalted. Oh yeah, that's another granddaddy of this uh, mm -hmm. this kind of design paradigm. And in the the first edition of Exalted, it was a huge deal to glow with essence, right? Because mm -hmm. you had the small pool that you had uh, your personal essence that you could use as much as you want, and then you had this larger pool that would make you glow like a bonfire, and it gave you access to your cool powers, but the, it would make the bad guys know that you were there. This is the exact same conceit, and because I'm not afraid of doing like the way like old school. Uh, in counter charts work, I have I have a more robust set of mechanisms for making certain there's a consequence to it. When I used to run Exalted, I found that glowing like a bonfire would only matter if you were within the vicinity of someone who gave a shit about you being a solar. Um, and if you weren't, it didn't really do anything. The creation is so gigantic that you could be so far off the map away from bad guys who actually care about you that like... <clears throat> Mostly what it would do would be signaling the crappy NPCs whose asses you are inevitably going to kick that their days are numbered. Mm -hmm. So 
So its consequences weren't that horrifying in a lot of uh, games that I ran. But in this game, especially early game, you don't have enough health to swing your giant glowing dick around that much. You really need to be careful. Um, and I, I, I like those kind of natural incentive mechanisms where it's like, it's not so much that the game's fiction is telling you don't do this, it's that the actual process of the game and the consequences of how the world works naturally gives you a reason not to. And I, I really like that a lot more. Yeah, and that's 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 something I can that's something I can definitely get behind. Um, now it's funny that you mentioned um pra, you mentioned prana as the as the resource since the um I'm guess I'm guessing that I'm guessing that was a bit of a name change from um chakras as it was originally. I mean, like, it is you still have chakra, mm -hmm. you still have your seven chakra, but they mm -hmm. produce prana. Uh, which is mythologically consistent with how it works in uh, Hindu mythology. Yeah, uh, and like that's the thing. I I don't remember what they were called in Legends of the Wulin suddenly, but they I think you got chi instead. Yeah, uh, yeah, you had you one. had you had chi of, of I think you you had a you had a bit of a chi approach, and um, I remember I remember um, taking taking that and reformatting that to to do a kind of chi equals lands idea that I was never able to ever able to finish but you had you had the five elements you had um you ha and you ha you had one you had one sort of wild card that I can't I can't remember the name of it and then you had um um demonic chi and mm. in your case um you've you've got the um you've got the five el you got the five classical elements and you have heaven and hell as as a unified thing yeah, I've got, I think I just kind of grabbed every element. So I've got the Ptolemyan elements in there. And I've got the, uh, because they kind of overlap with the mm -hmm. the five classic Chinese elements. And there's a couple of different ones in both cases. Like Ptolemy has air, whereas uh, the, um, and I want to say they're the Taoist elements. They might be like confusion or something, but I'm pretty sure the Taoist elements have uh, metal and wood, mm -hmm. which are part of their elemental thing. So I added all those and that gave me a total of six elements. And then for the seventh one, so I can link them up with the chakra, I just made like a, a kind of a divine slash magical one, which can kind of go different directions depending on what kind of martial artist you are. Because you can be, you, you can have evil hell chi, you can have heavenly good guy chi. Uh, you can just be some kind of sorcerer. I don't give a crap, whatever. And it's just a magic chakra. But yeah, so I wound up having like six elements and then kind of like a... a three potentials for the seventh element, depending on which orientation that you have. Yeah. Um, now I know, th I, now I did want to ask a bit on the, on the whole notion of, um, of clan and archetype. Now, mm. Tian Shang of course, of course had, um, cast instead of clan, but yes. I think fun functionally speaking, they're, fi they're, um, fairly similar. Well, sort of. Uh, remember that, like the the broader mythology of this setting. So it's the same setting, mm -hmm. but the broader mythology of this setting really powerful, powerfully borrows from Hindu mythology, which is powerfully caste based. Mm -hmm. And in in Tian Sheng, like the the broader setting, where you are in your enlightenment determines like your power level in a really like in a, in a very different way. They're almost as divided as classes uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so it's, yeah. And the, the kind of being you are, so like you can be a lot of different kinds of being in that. So you can be like, uh, the, the handsome monkey King is his own kind of being, uh, he's like an enlightened animal thing. And then we have Rakshasa, which are their own thing. And then we have demons. So like it's, it's way bigger and more cosmological in that case. Clan in this one is way closer to just being part of a martial brotherhood. So it's more of a social thing and less of like a, a cosmic here is your place in the hierarchy thing. Uh, they're in the same place in the character sheet, but they they're enormously different concepts. So Yeah. Now when now um when it comes to now we took the last time I had you on, we d we went into a few examples of some of the clans and and some and some of the um, analogs that we that we can that we can use, i.e., which i.e. which clan oh, would yeah, fit, that was fun. which clan would, which clan would fit Kenshiro, which which would fit um, which would fit Ray and and so on. Um, now when it com now when it comes to archetype. 
Mm-hmm. Um, is that where, like, where does what does the um, ar- what does the archetype bring to bring to the proverbial table? Is it more of is it more of a narrativist approach, or or are there are there some more tactical entries when it comes to what archetype does? Well, I mean. I don't, I don't want to use the term narrativist for it because it's not a story consideration. Like I know I use the term archetype, which is kind of something you would you would associate with narrativism. But like when I think archetype, I think more like the case of how someone like personality wise approaches the martial arts, you know, and they're like there's a lot of daddies to this game. And so, like, uh, Aang from Avatar The Last Airbender is a very different character, although he's structurally a martial artist who has magical powers, but he's a very different character than, say, Kenshiro, who's a very different character than um, uh, Vash the Stampede from Trigon, who still mm-hmm. kind of has his own, like, ma- magical martial art when you write down. It's just gun-based. And so, like, thinking about the way those characters approach problem-solving, like, thinking about like what their their core tactical appeal is and also kind of like what their journey is as far as like where their growth is and how they see the world and and how they grow as people like that's where that's where i started when it came to the archetypes and they 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 also have a little bit of the rooting in the old school class systems from D&D because again the class system in D&D is kind of brilliant even if you just break it down to like fighter versus uh, magic user which is like the core divide I like having fighter, magic, user, thief, because I think those are kind of the three three archetypical ways that you can kind of approach the sort of Western fantasy. Are you a big, huge, burly, like, Beowulf type? Are you a wizard? Are you Merlin? Or are you kind of a cunning and clever fellow, like your Robin of Loxley's? And those, those are all, like functionally they're all heroes and they all kind of use like similar like, not necessarily like similar powers but kind of similar approaches to like to being heroes but like they're also like tactically they're different and the way those characters advance are different so it's mm-hmm. kind of the same way with my three archetypes um and i think my i really wanted to bring forth the sort of archetypical um like the because weapons of the gods had archetypes too i don't remember if they called them archetypes or not but they, like they did and yeah, it, they were they the were vi- they were about they were I'd say I'd say the I'd say the archetypes with weapons of the gods are about as broad as um, archetypes that you'd see in any storyteller system game, be it be it Exalted mm-hmm. um, or any of the World of Darkness games. Oh yeah, and in a, in a game with a central die pool where it's just how cool you are is that die pool. And it's for every skill and everything you could possibly under the sun. It's mm-hmm. important to have some things that allow you to kind of say, well, yes, but my character is different because so like you need to have those things so people can kind of realize their way of doing stuff. Yeah. So the the three I chose, uh, the strong, cunning and enlightened are kind of based on that. Uh, so your scholar sort of characters are going to be more like enlightened characters. You know, they their their growth is about learning and getting like spiritually aware and becoming more cosmically linked, which is distinct from a character that's just like a really super badass like post apocalypse warlord mm-hmm. who just wants to conquer and become more powerful. Like Rao. those are both <laughs> well, Yeah, oh yeah. And Rao is a very different character than Kinshiro. Mm-hmm. Like my Kinshiro stand in, whose name is Hero, of course, because of course it is is an enlightened character. But if I had a Rao stand in character, which I don't currently, but like I mean, of course, I'm going to eventually. He'd be a strong archetype because, like, he has a different way of approaching things. In the in that regard, would would Ray be a um, cunning arch- archetype? Ugh, I'm trying to think what. I think so. I think Ray would be cunning, um, and Jaggy would also be cunning in my estimation because he's always like he's always using his mind to think of some trick or some scheme, you know, and he's really strong. But I don't think he's actually as strong as Rao in a lot of ways. Like, not not even if he had a lot more time to train, I don't think he'd ever really get as like raw powerful as Rao. And he doesn't have the connection to Hokno Shinkin that uh, that Ken does. You know, he doesn't have that kind of like internal balance that allows him to do it. So yeah, I'd say he's cunning too. No, no, J- Jagi is um, <laughs> is nice. I love him so much. <laughs> If I ever do a self-insert in this game, if I ever make Kazuki draw me a self-insert, I'm going to be dressed up like Jagi. Yeah. Um, 
I'm pr I'm having I'm having some I'm having some art commission because a few a few people who I've who I've been associating with have been nicknaming me the Ice Dragon. <laughs> so Ice I think so I think I figure I, I figure I may as well um may as well follow suit with it. I can see that. Um but when it now in with regardless the character sheet design, I'm guessing, is not going to be too far removed from Tian Shang, and thus it's going to be significantly lighter than, say, oh, yeah. than, say Weapons of the Gods or Le Legends of the Wu Lin. Um, uh, it's about um, the same level of complexity, I think. I, I I do think there's a little more density in our sheet because, like those, you're really supposed to play off the sheet in those games, mm -hmm. and especially Weapons of the Gods. There's a lot of stuff going on in your sheet, like you've got the different chi pools and all that, mm -hmm. and um. Like, yeah, I, I want you to, be able to do the same thing with this game where, like, you kind of got your sheet in front of you and you're sort of playing off of it. You're moving around your prana and you're set, you're moving your sets around and you're saving stuff in your focus slots. And that's actually somewhere on the sheet. So that was really important to bring forth in the design. And there, there should be a couple of early designs um, in the, uh, yeah, in Blood from God's Eye, which is that document mm -hmm. I keep referencing. Um, I'm going to redesign those a, a touch because the game's advanced a little bit since then, but not too yeah. much. Like they're really close to perfect. And, uh, Victor Andre is the guy that actually brought those to life. He's our, uh, our graphics designer, our layout guy. Mm -hmm. And as you can probably tell, he's really capable because aesthetically they look cool too. They've got kind of a, I feel like they have kind of a try gun look to them, which I think is a great aesthetic for this kind of game. Oh yeah. Um, and what now, so, now, um, some, Something that I'm a, something that I'm a bit cu a bit curious about is now you with with this particular game you do have the relationship with with um health and aura and mm -hmm. what I find interesting is that because of how it's um described here you're effectively buying off um damage yeah and I wanted to drive it, it cause that was really important doing it that mm -hmm. way because I wanted to drive home that getting stabbed with a knife is fatal. And you, as a person, are way, way, way ridiculously tougher than a normal person. Mm -hmm. So I like that buying off. And it doesn't actually change anything about how you interact with it, like, strategically. But it changes the way you think about what you are doing while it's happening. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. You're, you're just, you're absorbing this knife blow with either just this mystical essence or just your raw meat. And it makes you feel super tough, even when you're getting your ass kicked, which is really important yeah. for the like, feel of the game. It isn't. It isn't at the same level of complexity, but it kind. It kind of reminded me of the whole buying off damage thing that, um, Ten Rabancho Zero has. Oh yeah, that's another big daddy for this game. I, I actually in earlier drafts I had a, a special box you had to check before you died, and, and mm -hmm. very similar to that game. I've I've since omitted it because I feel like it's redundant with how tough I've made characters, and also again it's a little gamey. You know, I don't know what what's happening in the world when the death box gets checked off. Tinder Rancho Zero does a really good job of saying, okay, that's when you've committed to death and you become like superhuman, but like. My game already has something like that. When you get like a torso wound, you begin to die mm -hmm. and you have to deal with it. So I, I already have something that's similar and kind of works more towards the way this game is supposed to feel. So yeah. I don't want to I don't want to steal too much from uh, TVZ, although, God, what a game that is. It's a really fun one. Yeah, I, I feel like I feel like I'm going to have to gonna have to dive back, dive back into that and hope <laughs> against hope that somebody translates Tenra War one of these days. Well, we need to we need to find Luke Crane and drag him kicking and screaming back to the job. <laughs> Come on, Crane, you're up to it. Yeah. Um. And I will I will admit that part of the reason I say that is because my fa my um my one of my all time favorite R um video game RPG series is Wild Arms. Good taste. Um. But. Given the given the fact that advancement is gonna is of course gonna be based on um car, is gonna be based on karma, mm. whenever there's any sort of um XP as currency ap approach when it comes to games, there's always the question in the back of my mind of how um choice paralysis is going to be mitigated. Um, some games will some games will do a fairly decent job with mitigating it, and some game and sometimes you have well, GURPS, which does yeah. not mitigate it. <laughs> yeah, and different people have different susceptibilities to that choice paralysis. I, I don't find my... Like, usually whenever I make a character for this game, I have a pretty clean concept. And so, like, 
I don't find a lot of options that don't work with that concept to be very tempting. I would say there's a lot of considerations with this one because there's the realization of a concept, which I think is a legitimate reason to advance in any direction. But there's also the tactical consideration that I really made certain that all of the styles have glaring tactical weaknesses. Like all of them have something that they are critically missing that would make them a, a complete style. Mm -hmm. So you're powerfully encouraged to kind of grow out and and shore up those tactical weaknesses or find a way to function in your party such as that they're mitigated. So that actually hurts in the terms of adding more to the paralysis because you really have to think like, okay, what do I need tactically in these different circumstances? Yeah. I would say that in playtesting, what has come out is that because you don't have all the options in front of you, you're only able to learn techniques that you have someone willing to teach you that actually know the techniques or you found a manual. Uh, so you only have a much smaller amount of options, A, and B, when players are playing the game, the strategy they have to use becomes very apparent to them very quickly because like, they naturally have more opportunities to do the thing that their style wants to do. So like, if they use Path of the Bullet, which is the gun style, they have a lot of opportunity to get distance from the foe and a lot of opportunity to shoot the hell out of them, but they'll find their strikes are kind of lacking in, in stopping power. They're more like of a, a more of a kiter, and they're not great if they get cornered. And so, like, it becomes really obvious what works for their style and what they need to shore that up. So if they have some really good defensive techniques or if they have some good grapple techniques they have access to, suddenly it's like, well, why wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. and, and so it really brings the choices that are the, the most appropriate and, like, the most available to the forefront. And it does really help with the analysis paralysis. Yeah. And... I will now. I will. It's one of those. It's one of those things where there's no right answer, and um, and honestly, trying to fix um, choice paralysis is a, is a folly in my in my view because then you end up going um, a little t a little too restrictive. And if that if that's the case, you may as well just play a story game. <laughs> well, or you can just do classes. I, I don't have any real problem with doing a class based game. I'm 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 being I'm being partially facetious when when I uh, when I say that. Um. Because even even with that, people want, people are gonna want to put their own their own spin. Oh and, yeah, and I I find that I have the most fun with groups in old school games whenever there's something extra that isn't in the rule books that I give them for their class, mm -hmm. like a social benefit or like so some dark god blesses them and gives them weird blue magic or something. Like that's when those games kind of come alive when you have like that little bit extra element that you as a GM get to add. Um, so yeah, and. Now, when now, um, when it comes to the, when it comes to the full when it comes to the full book, um, obviously things are going obviously things are going to be in flux as they always are when de when development goes down. But what are you shooting for as far as a page size? Uh, so, not as page size, yeah, page count. Page count. Well, right now it's somewhere in the two hundred and two hundred and fifty range, depending on how we format. Mm -hmm. uh, I've yet to add the second wave of martial arts because again, I doubled them from the first draft because there were there was one martial art per clan. Now there are two, and I'm wanting to put in some more like partial styles too. Um, I've yet to put in the new draft of the Guptkala, uh, which will probably actually be lighter than the current draft, but there's also more of them. Um, I've yet to put in the bestiary because there's a really robust bestiary. Every different kind of terrain type gets its own uh, spray of monsters that you're likely to encounter there. So there's a lot of monsters now, a lot of, a lot of nice gribblies for you to fight. I've yet to put in the armory, uh, which is all the tanks and, and helicopters and cool kind of motorcycles and such like that you can reasonably find and potentially repair without making them explode. Because it wouldn't be Mad Max if you didn't have like dude buggies and tanks and such. Mm -hmm. Um I've yet to put I've the big thing that's missing in it is like the the fluff for the clans and then like all the different lands that they have because I really want to do and I've got a template for like sitting around here I've got all my note my disorganized notepads but there's this process of my creativity where I will write a ton of stuff on notepads and I will take the cream of that and I will type that out that will actually find its way into the final document and I've yet to do that with the clan stuff because I really want to do something like similar to the the Yoon Soon uh, game, where there's in Yoon Soon 
it's incredible because like they have this gigantic map and every segment of that map, every little like part of it has its own identity. And all of those have like this way of creating a campaign there that like gives you the contents of a bunch of hexes and like the socio political structure and a bunch of interesting places you can encounter and creatures you can encounter and all that that complicate it. And it's in these this really elegant and small but extremely imaginative series of like like generator charts. Mm -hmm. And I want to do something like that for the game where depending on where you want to set the game or what elements you want to set it in, you can just make your own setting really quickly in the series of a couple of rolls and just, you know, fill up a couple of pages of a notebook and suddenly you've got weeks or months worth of a game with, you know, one afternoon's worth of generating a, a little setting for your for your characters. So that stuff is not currently in there. It needs to get compiled. I need to get my best ideas and put them on paper for all the different factions. Um, so long story short, it's going to be an amazingly complete game. I would love if it were some kind of 500 page super tome, like exalted third edition. Ideally, it will probably be somewhere in the 300 to 350 range at most, because I want to make sure I'm kind of controlling the cost of that hardback, uh, as much as possible. And I don't want my, uh, my word count to outrun my art budget too much. Because I really want to have like art for all those monsters, or as many as I can, and art for the different kinds of terrain, and art for the different kinds of characters, and you know, like I don't have infinite money to put art in this book. Uh, yeah. We do have a really good artist. I'm sure you've seen some of Kazuki stuff for this. Mm -hmm. Like some, some of the art is brilliant for it, but like I need to pay that guy. And so if I get too luxurious in page count, it's going to be really thin on the art. So there's a little bit of a balancing act there. But yeah, three three hundred to three fifty is kind of my comfort zone for it. Yeah, and to to be honest, that's uh, two two to two fifty to three fifty is where is where I tend to tend to like things going. Um, mm. The big th the big thing, of course, mainly because I end up complaining about it one way or another in almost every one of my reviews, is navigation. Mm, um, have an index, yeah. Yeah, the, that usability is incredibly vital to this document. Like I'm sure and you got to all above heaven, right? Like you got that mm -hmm. little thing that we made. Yeah. All right. And that one has a really good usability because it like guides you through. It's logically laid out. And then like it's really easy to reference the different parts of it. You know, there's a really good index in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we and that the, we have the same editor and the same layout guy for this. So we, we should have absolutely no problem making this a, a, a tome you can use at the table with confidence. Yeah, so it's just, just I've um I've seen some people put out these massive two or three hundred page books, and they they um don't bookmark the PDF, and and sometimes they they either don't put it in the index or they have the index a separate document. And I'm like, don't do don't do that because that is a fast track to get on my permanent shit list. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I need to make sure I've got because I don't know if the I don't know if the one we have for. Uh... All above heaven is bookmarked or not, but I really need. To it's that not, out. but Ooh, that's uh, one of those situations <laughs> where I'm not going where I'm not going to fault you for it because. Well, the, I mean that was our initial the documents like the documents like 57 pages. Yeah, it's not that bad. Uh, same way, and I I formatted uh, Blood from God's Eye myself is because I didn't really want to pay anyone else to do it because I just wanted to get that out for free mm -hmm. as a test of the system. So I don't feel terrible about that. Yeah. My my own skill set is in designing and writing games. It's not for all that other stuff. All those wonderful quality of life enhancements. Yeah, it's what it obviously it's one of those things that um et, that ends up being ends up being evolving as a nat, as a natural skill. Um, some pe some people have an alternate approach, like say um Wade Dyer, the um fra the frag guy, who mm. d who goes out of his way when it comes to hyperlinks on his on his PDFs, which mm. is how he justifies not having an a um in a index because of the amount of bookmarking and and hyperlinks in the text that he puts in. I feel like you could do both. You know, um, I feel like you could do both. Which is definitely nice, but I've 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 often I've often wondered. Okay, but okay, but what if somebody's using a printed version? Is yeah, POD, if you get a POD, POD or something. Is a thing. Then. Yeah, and I for. For this game, it really plays the best at a table. Like, I, it's not impossible to play out of the document, as I found, because you can scroll it up and down really easily if you know how to look through it. But, mm -hmm. like, I usually have it open in Google Docs instead of as the PDF, because, like, right there on the sidebar, I've got this wonderful little ability just to grab different sections and go to them directly. So, yeah, I want to make sure the PDF is usable that way uh, for the main game. 
I will say again, like I really strongly suggest getting the hardback for this though. I know it's a little more expensive, but like you won't regret it. It's going to be gorgeous. Number one, it's mm-hmm. going to be heavy. Number two and number three, this game plays best in person. It really does. So, yeah. And when it, now I know, now I know you've got, I know you've got, um, 19 days, 19 days to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and we are already funded. Mm-hmm. Very pleased about that. Yes. Um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release, wi- as far as a release window in 2021? Uh, I gave myself six months from January in 2021. Uh, so uh, June, July is whenever we should see the PDF. And then about two months after that is when I did the release date for the hardback. Uh, now, that's because we've never done a project of this size before. And I want to make sure that I'm not messing people's expectations. It may actually take that long. Ideally, it will not take any longer, but honestly, we're so far along in the writing, and I'm already talking to Albert Lim, our technical editor, and uh, Victor Andre, our layout guy. I really don't feel like it's going to take that long. Um, so I, ideally, I would have it out. Let me see. Writing-wise, I'd really like to have it completely done in the next month or two, just because mostly because the hard stuff, the design that took me so long to drag myself through is done, and now it's all just like write the kung fu styles which i've been doing as the kickstart has been going on so they're really easy to write uh write the gachala which again i've already written them to completion so it's not like it's hard to rewrite those in a way that is a little more readable um do all the setting stuff which is something that it's kind of the equivalent of writing it for a DD game where i'm mostly just describing things and because descriptions are your prep in this uh system it's just it's such it's such easy like prose based writing to do that it will just basically take no time. It'll take me more time to think of that many good ideas than it will to write them down and translate them. So ideally, I'd like to have the writing done by the end of January because there's just not much to do, and then hand it completely over to Albert and just work on the tech edit and the layout with Vic uh, over the next couple of months. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, because I want to make sure that we're getting that PDF formatted and, and beautiful and usable. Uh, I, I'm kind of split past that, whether or not we wanted to release it quickly and make it less usable and then just kind of upgrade it over the next couple of months as we work on it towards uh, doing the print on demand. Um, or if we want to wait a little while and make sure it's really usable beforehand and then and, and make everybody wait a little longer to play it. Uh, I mean, I've already kicked this thing out in several forms where it's not quite ready for the limelight yet just because I wanted to show people because I was excited about it and I wanted to build some... Uh, build some steam which apparently we did so again we kickstarted really quick um but yeah so that's that's kind of what it looks like right now as far as like the timetable uh, i'm i'm really optimistic about the project uh and kazuki is the only other x factor there cuz he's he's doing most of the art for it but like kazuki uh Kimberly Clevin is another one of the artists that i want to tap for it and i've got a couple others that i'm romancing right now i'm not going to name drop them yet but if i get them in i'm going to have them uh do stuff too um mm-hmm. uh, the the benefit of those dudes is that their turnaround is extremely fast. I've had times when I've pitched an idea to Kazuki and he has done it to completion by the next day. And like his his quality is such that at first I was like terrified that he was like tracing or something because I was like, no one is this fast. Apparently he is. Uh, I can't reverse image search this stuff. I can't find it anywhere. It's legitimate like from his skill level art. So I'm not super worried about him as a hang up for the project. Yeah, and I, when it comes, I have seen people who are who are that fast, and some and some people are just that level of nuts. Um, oh yeah, plus Dude, Kazuki is that level of nuts. He's unbelievable. <laughs> plus you've you've you you're now dot aware of the um, insane amount of output that Brandon Sanderson has when it comes to putting out books. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. I really should have gotten off my ass for this a few times. Just like twenty. 2019, first of all, was not a great year for me, and then 2020 happened. So mm-hmm. sorry, I am sorry, folks. Uh, but we, we got our, we finally got our act together after those two twin hammers to my life. But yeah, yeah. well, the, these things, ha- these things, ha- these things happen. Fortunately, we're in the home, st- we're in the home stretch of t- of 2020, and it can't, it can't go anywhere but up. Yeah, like usually I wouldn't make that kind of uh, bold claim in the face of fate, having having survived 2016 and now 2020. But like, you know what? If it gets worse, it'll be an apocalypse level like extinction event. So, eh, 
I'll, I'll tempt fate a little well, bit. Well, I survived an ice age a few years ago, so... <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. It's like sounds like you survive an ice age basically every winter. So there was there was a polar so. vortex a few years ago where it was like sixty five below. So oh as far as God. I'm concerned, that counts as an ice age. Yeah, no joke. If it could kill a Tyrannosaurus, then it counts as an ice age. Mm -hmm. But with with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for take for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. <laughs> Never too busy to revisit the monastery. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>